people on YouTube as well. Uh, well, ooh, here we go. We got comments from all of you. Oh, keep doing that. We'll get this system working. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to a, the highlight of human civilization. Coffee with Scott Adams. If you'd like to take this experience up the levels that nobody can even understand with their little human brains, all you need is a cup or a mug or a glass, a tanker, chalice, a stein, a canteen, jug, or flask, a vessel of any kind. Fill it with your favorite liquid. I like coffee. And join me now for the unparalleled pleasure. The dopamine of the day the thing that makes everything better is called a simultaneous sip. And it happens now. Go. Ah, well, people are pouring in because the news is so much fun. So much fun. All right, here's a interesting piece of news I saw in a Brian Romelli post. There's a solar-powered weed picker that can work all day in the fields picking weeds, and it doesn't weigh much, and uh, it just runs around picking weeds. And... Apparently, that allows you to use uh, fewer pesticides, but really, it's the beginning of my robot farm. <laughs> I don't know why, but I always wanted to own a farm, but I don't like getting dirty and stuff. I don't like bugs and hay bales and cow poop and stuff. I like a nice gentleman farm, a robot-run farm, indoors preferably. But if it has to be outdoors, I'll need one of these uh, weed pickers. I'm telling you, the future is indoor farms because I think that people will grow their own food because our food supply is so unhealthy. So I think the big push for growing your own food is going to be health, uh, not cost or convenience. Also, maybe for emergencies in case things go wrong. Well, on the positive side for energy, Bill Gates' Terra Power plant. Uh, it's a next generation nuclear power plant um, applied to start construction. It's a sodium cooled reactor. And it would be in Wyoming and uh, it would be about half the cost of a regular power plant. It could be half the cost and uh, blah blah blah. Yeah. So that's a big deal. There's a whole bunch of stuff happening in nuclear but this is one of them. So I'm glad we have some billionaires who can put gigantic amounts of money into things that take 20 years to build. So I don't know what you would do if you didn't have billionaires. Government would do it? Well, I guess the government would do it faster. <laughs> It'd be like China. Uh, there's a Chinese auto executive who warns that uh, there's a... Let's see, what word did he use? Huh. He said there's a bloodbath coming for American auto industry because his cars are so good that the U.S. is going to have an automotive bloodbath. He's the CEO of uh, Xpeng Motors. Uh, how do you pronounce that? X-P-E-N-G? X-G-Peng? I don't know. But it's a bloodbath, because they're bringing their cheap uh, EVs over here, he says. So I hope the mainstream media doesn't take him out of context, if you know what I mean. All right, um, Mario Nofal warns us that over on YouTube there's a fake um, there's a fake video of a gentleman named Michael Saylor, who's uh, famous for talking about Bitcoin, but uh, he's been altered by AI to appear to ask people to scan a code on their screen, and it's all a big scam. And apparently, it's just been running at the time of. The time I saw the post from Mario, it had been running for over an hour. So YouTube doesn't have what X has, which is community notes. So, so there's not immediately a comment saying, oh, this is a scam, it's deep fake. How many people do you think fell for it on YouTube today? And it might even still be there. I don't know, if it was up for an hour, maybe it kept going. But 
uh, this is going to be really, really dangerous. I have to say, it didn't look real to me, but it was close. And I could imagine how people would think it was real. But you know, maybe, maybe if I didn't know it wasn't real when I saw it, I would have thought it was real. But I was already primed to, to know it wasn't. All right, uh, Scotland, I don't know if you know this, Scotland doesn't have free speech anymore. <laughs> so you can actually go to jail for saying things that the government doesn't like you saying. In Scotland. Boy, you, uh, how quickly you can lose all your rights. Now, obviously, we've, we've lost our, uh, most of our rights here in the United States as well. But, uh, yeah, police officers, Ian Miles Chung was talking about this on X. The police officers in Scotland can look at your social media, and if you said something that they considered a hate crime, uh, and that could be anything that would be, let's say, uh, threatening and abusive, that is communicated through public performance or play or the internet. So what would be threatening and abusive in the government's opinion? That's a little bit uh, little dangerous, don't you think? Do you think the government could say that, well, well, let's use me, for example. Let's use me. If, if I'd said everything I've ever said in America, uh, if I said it under Scotland's current law, do you think they could have picked anything I ever said, something, is there anything I've ever said that they could have defined in their personal opinions as threatening and abusive? Of course they could. Everybody who says anything interesting could be interpreted as, as th threatening and abusive. So the, the real effect of it is a complete end to free speech. So uh, Great Britain has largely fallen in terms of a free country. I think, I think they're dead. But Scotland's in bad shape. All right, Peter Navarro apparently has lost all of his challenges and will be reporting to jail. Peter Navarro, if you don't know, will be a political prisoner of the Biden administration. Now you could say, but Scott, technically there was a crime for obstructing Congress or something. To which I say, yeah, and you all know that nobody else would have been prosecuted. Peter Navarro is a political prisoner in the United States in 2024. And I'll say it again, I don't have one reason for supporting Trump. You know, there are other advantages. But if Trump is going to free the political prisoners, I don't need to hear anything else. I really don't. Because this is top priority. You can't put fucking people in prison for political reasons and still have a country. you got to fix this first. Everything else is good too, but you know I don't even care. It's basically just this. It's my top thing. Used to be fentanyl. I used to say fentanyl is my top thing, but once I learned that the fentanyl problem is coming from the United States and it's a choice, you know that, right? The press has told you that fentanyl is a problem of China is selling precursors to the cartels, and then they sell it in, and there's nothing we can do about it. But that's before you understood, you know, the entire blob octopus mechanism. It, it's pretty obvious. I would consider it a confirmed fact that the fentanyl business is allowed by some some entity, and our government is allowing it expressly. And it must be allowed because we're working some kind of arrangement with the cartels. And that means we're getting something, I hope. I hope we're getting something in return. It's probably control over the countries that the cartels operate in. Because the cartels control their own governments, and we'd like to control the governments in some cases too, so we can do business and all that, to keep China out, that sort of stuff. So we probably just have a deal with the cartels that if they do a few things that we need, like don't attack American corporations, don't let the Chinese or the Russians take over your country, um, then we probably just let them operate. We meaning, you know, our CIA, etc. So um, since that's not solvable by Trump or anybody else, uh, my biggest issue is the political prisoners. So I'm going to read in full Peter Navarro's statement, uh, and of number one, respect, and number two, 
It's important. Is this the most interesting news you're going to hear today? Nope. It's just really, really important. You need to understand that this is happening. He's be, he was hunted, just like thousands of January 6th people. There's now some influencer who had you know just a glancing contact with the protest, I guess walk, might have walked into the building for 90 seconds and out, and now will you know, maybe go to jail. Yeah. All of this has to end, the political prisoners. Here is a statement by Peter Navarro today regarding the Supreme Court decision, which um, uh, it's a statement after Justice John Roberts rejected his, uh, his ability to be released pending appeal. Keep that in mind. Here's a nonviolent crime that most people say shouldn't have even been charged. And he doesn't doesn't get to remain free while he's appealing it. I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, since when do you not get freedom when you're appealing for a nonviolent crime? Is that is that a standard procedure? I don't know if I've ever even heard of it. I mean, so I, I wouldn't even need to hear anything else. I wouldn't even need to know what Peter Navarro did or didn't do if he told me that he can't be free while he's appealing something that's completely nonviolent. That's crazy. All right, so here's what Peter Navarro says. Uh, Justice Roberts took care to note that his reason for denial was quote, distinct from my pending appeal on the merits. That appeal on the merits will continue, and if I fail in that appeal, after nonetheless serving my full prison term, just note that, that by the time the appeal is completed, whether he wins or not, he will have served his entire prison term. That means that the justice has removed his ability to appeal in a meaningful way. Can you even hold that in your head? My head is exploding. They're going to make him serve his entire time while the appeal's happening for a non nonviolent crime. While people who are killing people are getting like, you know, smaller sentences and freed and, well, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know what I mean. People doing way worse crimes are out on parole. So in our, in our, I mean, I don't even know what to say about this. This is this is certainly not the worst thing that's ever happened in America in terms of the number of people involved, but it might be the worst thing that's ever happened in America because this goes right to the basic concept of the whole country, right? Now, I'm not going to say it's worse than you know, giving diseases to the Tuskegee air people. It's not worse than, uh, it's not worse than slavery. So there, there are other things that are worse in terms of scale. But in terms of a direct attack on the central promise of America, this is quite the gut punch. I feel this personally. I feel this completely personally. This, uh, this isn't just a story I'm reading in the news. This is, I could be next. Do you, have, do you realize how easily they could pick me up on some bullshit, put me in prison? Do you realize how close that is? This is completely personal to me. All right, reading the rest. After nonetheless serving my full prison term, the constitutional separation of powers will be irreparably damaged, and the doctrine of executive privilege, which is what he was claiming, dating back to George Washington, will cease to function as an important safeguard for effective presidential decision-making. There is much at stake here, and it is worth the fight. I'm actually surprised he's, he took it as far as he did, but I respect it. The partisan nature of the imprisoning of a top senior White House aide should chill the bones of every American. It does. In Joe Biden's weaponized justice system, a Democrat-controlled Congress and Justice Department together with an Obama-appointed district judge and three Obama-appointed appeals court judges drove the Navarro Railroad right into prison. If anybody thinks these partisans and politicians in robes aren't coming for Donald Trump, 
they must think it twice now. I'll give you uh, Joel uh, Pollock's opinion on this. Uh, uh, he talked about Navarro. He says, when he arrives in prison, uh, Peter Navarro will be a political prisoner. He defied a subpoena from a one-sided show trial that broke its own rules and later destroyed evidence. All true. DOG allowed actual contempt by Lois Lerner and Eric Holder to go unpunished. Uh, his sentence, meaning Navarro, is our disgrace. Agreed. This is a disgrace. I don't feel good to be an American. That's for sure. Because whatever America was when I was a kid, maybe it never was, I don't know. But it's definitely not this. This is, it's the depth of evil. This is a signal that there's no limit to what they will do. This tells you there's no limit. Yeah. So when you see a whistleblower allegedly commit suicide in his car, how do you believe that when Peter Navarro is being put in prison? They tell us that our elections were perfectly uh, clean. How do you believe the elections were clean when they're putting Peter Navarro in prison? I don't. I, I think that's good enough to assume that everything's rigged. When you watch this happen, you can, it's sort of like in um, a court case where they say, if the, if the witness has lied about one thing and you know that that's a lie, you're, you should think that everything else the witness says is not credible. And so I do. So because of Peter Navarro, I now disbelieve 100% of everything my fucking stupid government and Department of Justice says, because they've given me permission to distrust everything. Good job, assholes. Good job. So this has to be fixed. And uh, let, let, me, uh, let me go through the arguments against uh, Trump. Blah, blah, blah. He lied that time. I don't care. Blah, blah, blah. Stormy. Yeah, I don't care. I don't care. Blah, blah, blah. He said those things that made us upset mm, don't care don't care uh he may have technically broken some kind of law that nobody ever has been charged with before don't care he may have taken some documents that technically could be considered by some people to be classified but other people say no don't care he may have overvalued some of his assets in a completely normal way that everybody in the industry does don't care he may have said bad things about somebody uh, that he allegedly had some interaction with, but maybe he didn't because it doesn't sound real to me. I don't care. I don't fucking care. Peter Navarro's in prison. Peter Navarro's in prison. That, that might be my answer to every you know, remaining online conversation. Oh, Scott, why do you believe this conspiracy theory about the government? Because Peter Navarro is in fucking prison. That gives me permission to believe everything's corrupt. That is permission to believe everything is corrupt. And so I do. And so I do. It's, it's flipping a little switch inside my head, I'll tell you. If this doesn't change everything for you, wait till they put Trump in prison. See how you feel then. Well, as you know, wokeness is a form of self-harm and uh, a mental illness, and you can see it in, in every way that it comes out. Let me give you another example. Uh, the Washington State has decided that uh, you could be a lawyer there uh, without passing the bar exam. Why are they doing that? Is that to help marginalized people? Because that's what they say. No, it's just self-harm. It's just self-harm. Why, why would you want to go from a system where your lawyers are uh, verified to have a certain level of capability to a system where they don't, and your life depends on it? <laughs> it's self-harm. Why do we keep the, uh, the border open? It's self-harm. 
There was a ruling today. Some judge said that uh, people who are in the country illegally also have the right to own firearms in this country. Why would you make a ruling like that? Self-harm, right? They all have the same quality. You don't have to look very far for it. It's all self-harm. This is some kind of guilt, you know, white guilt from, I don't know, slavery or just all the, the media pecking on them for decades, or whatever it is. But uh, no, the, the, you can guarantee that um, the people who are in the woke state will pick whatever is the most harm to themselves. Now, I'm not arguing that it's not good for the other people. It is good for them. It's definitely good for the people they're trying to help, except that it always has the quality that's bad for the people who are already here and people who are making these policies. The self-harm is crazy. All right, meanwhile, uh, Barack Obama uh, had some meeting with the UK prime minister that was, let's say, uh, undisclosed in terms of the why of it. And he's meeting with, I don't know, some some royal family in Belgium or something. So apparently he's over the, over in Europe doing something that looks like a statesman kind of a visit ahead of the election. What do you think that's about? Well, let me see. If Peter Navarro were not just being put in jail, what I would say about that is, huh, he's just an ex-president who knows a lot of people and maybe he wants to stay connected and it's sort of a social visit and maybe they invited him for coffee and he just said yes. Maybe he was going to be there anyway, and he got an invitation, and he thought, oh, that'd be a good idea. I'll say hi. It could be that. If Peter Navarro were not in jail, that's what I'd say. But Peter Navarro was in jail or going to jail. So you know what I say? I say it looks like Obama is working an op in which he couldn't say it on the phone, so he had to go there in person. And the reason he's there in person is to push some kind of an op in which our our, uh, foreign allies, in this case the UK, maybe the Five Eyes in general, will do some kind of spying on our behalf or come up with some kind of fuckery to take out Trump. I assume that this is all about putting Trump in jail for reasons that they have not yet come up with. Do you know why I think that? Because Peter Navarro is going to jail. So don't don't even ask me to believe that the, that the government is doing anything honest, ever. I don't even want to hear the argument. You've lost, you've lost that privilege. You've lost the privilege of the benefit of a doubt. Right? If you want it back, maybe release the political prisoners. Then we can talk. But for now, I'm just assuming the worst, and I think that's a smart assumption. All right. Uh, you want some good news? Maybe. You can you can see this as good news or bad news. Uh, I see it as fake news. <laughs> Probably fake. So there's a report from Bloomberg, but nobody else, uh, that a credible source is saying that Trump has ruled out Vivek as his vice president, but uh, he's looking at him for a potential cabinet job. Now, is that true? Yeah, there's one source as Bloomberg. Go. Is that true? Well, I guess anything's possible. But Bloomberg is not a credible source uh, for news. Do you know how I know that? I once made the mistake of allowing a Bloomberg journalist to spend the day with me to write a feature story about me. When I didn't realize this, so this was like 2016-ish, I don't know, somewhere around then. And I didn't realize at the time that it was just to take me out. Do you think that they printed the story accurately and got all the details right? Of course not. Did they even try? It didn't look like it. It didn't look like they were trying to do it, honestly. So what they did with me, my impression of it, was it was a political hit job in the guise of publication. So that's how you should look at this story. Maybe it's true. But maybe Bloomberg just made this shit up like they do other stuff because they're not a credible publication. Yeah, they're not credible. 
So, but let's talk about it. If and and then the rumor says that hell, um, the homeland security might be the cabinet job that Vivek is being considered for. Now, I could definitely go for that. I don't know what it would take to be in charge of that big sprawling, you know, organization. But uh, yeah, I could go for that. I don't know if Vivek would go for it. But if you if you airdrop a vague into our uh, homeland security, that's some fun. <laughs> that that would be some fun. I think we'd find out some things that we didn't know about, and I think there'd be a lot fewer people there when he was done. And I think a lot would get fixed pretty quickly. So. Uh, so my two thoughts about it, number one, it's not a credible report, but number two, if he ended up in a powerful cabinet position, country would do well with that. That could be really good. Speaking of Vivek, he was on CNN with Abby Phillip, um, and Abby is one of the spreaders of the fine people hoax. What happens if, you, if you're a correspondent type on CNN? and you spread the fine people hoax. What happens to you? Promoted. Promoted. Got her own show. So now Abby Phillip, spreader of the fine people hoax, has her own show, and she made the mistake of having Vivek on and asking him to comment about uh, Trump's use of the word vermin. Now, that is a good gotcha for the usual dumbasses in Congress. right? If you bring in some, you know, like, person, Person who, <laughs> who just looks good in a suit has good hair. So, what do you think about this vermin thing? And they're gonna they're gonna address the question. They're gonna treat it like it's an important enough question to actually answer it. Well, you know what he meant was this, and what he didn't mean was that, and you know you have to look at it in the big picture. No, all wrong. What you do is you take off your pants and you turn around and you shit in their mouth. Because that's what they ask for. That's what they deserve. They don't deserve an answer to that question. That, that's how you do, do you still beat your wife kind of fucking question. No, you should just unload on how unscrupulous and terrible and evil they are and then say what you want to say. So that's what Vivek did. <laughs> he shit in her mouth and then he said what he wanted to say. And he reminded everybody that the news is useless, fake crap, and that you know making you argue over the use of a word is the least useful thing the news could do. Thank you, Vivek. <laughs> Thank you. It was delicious. Yes. So no, um, that is exactly the way you should treat people who are not serious people who spread the fine people hoax, um, basically racist. So that's why you should treat them. Um, did you know that uh, Haiti shares a border with the Dominican Republic? Uh, and did you know that the Dominican Republic built a 12-foot fall, 12-foot wall to keep the Haiti uh, immigrants from crossing? So, so it's they call it a smart security fence. It's got drones and cameras and whatnot. So, do you do you know why the Dominican Republican is putting up a fence, and we're looking to fly them in? Do you know what the difference is? Is it because we're much kinder? No, it's self harm. It's self harm. We're we're less interested in helping them than we are in hurting ourselves. Whereas the Dominican Republic is saying, "Hey, what's good for the Dominican Republic?" Well, we, we, we also care about the Haitians, but first, you know, first we're going to take care of the Dominican Republic. But we're doing the opposite. We're looking at what's good for them, and uh, secondarily, well, who cares what's good for us? It's self-harm. Yeah, it's just self-harm. So you'll see that in every one of the woke decisions. They're all, they're all self-harm, and fairly obviously and blatantly. And it's from the people who cut themselves and put piercings in painful places. And, you know, it's the same people. The, the people who, for whatever reason, think that they need to be punished 
and you do too because you look a little bit like them. That's what it feels like. All right. Um, uh, now, Trump's getting in trouble for uh, the saying that, uh, let's see, he said, uh, if you're a Democrat and uh, if you vote for the Democrats and you're Jewish, it means you hate Israel and you hate your religion <laughs> or something like that. He goes, any Jewish person that votes for Democrats hates their religion, Trump said. Uh, and they hate everything about Israel. And they should be ashamed of themselves because Israel will be just destroyed under democratic leadership. Um, and he talked about Iran's ambitions to get nukes, etc. So, how was that treated? Well, the news uh, put it in context and said, you have to understand his bad comments uh, compared to their other hoaxes. So they compared it to the neo-Nazis fine people hoax and said that if you look at his comment about Jewish voters, it has to be understood in the context of their hoax. That's really happening. They're really telling you you have to understand his current comments in the context of their hoax. The same thing they did with all of Trump's comments. All of Trump's comments, they put through the filter of their other hoaxes. Well, if he hadn't done January 6th, you mean your hoax about it? Well, if he hadn't said the fine people, you mean your hoax that he said it. Didn't actually say that. So they've actually got the full wrap-up hoax thing working for their people who are apparently idiots um, who believe it. Uh, I saw a, a post from Ian Carroll, just somebody on the X platform. And uh, he's got some suspicions that the real reason for the, the interest in the TikTok ban right now, when that topic has been sort of floating around for years, and suddenly everybody got religion on it, and he says, uh, this is his theory, that uh, the guy who introduced it, Mike Gallagher, is a major, he gets major support from uh, APAC, a is Israel, uh, let's say, lobbying. Lobbying is the right word. So they're a pro-Israel lobbying group that has a lot of influence in the government. And so uh, Ian Carroll is su suspecting that really what's happening is that Israel wants to ban TikTok in the United States because TikTok had a lot of pro-Palestinian stuff and it was very bad for Israel, especially in the time of uh, middle of a hot war. And so he thinks that, uh, you know, like many, many of you suspicious people think, hey, maybe the Jews are really behind this whole TikTok ban, he says. Let me give you some clarity on that. Of course they are. <laughs> Of course they are. What was that supposed to be a secret? The TikTok just completely put a mon monkey wrench in their hot war. What are they supposed to be for it? Uh, how how would they not be against it? Now the reason that we know that Mike Gallagher has money from APAC is because it's public information. It's public information. It's transparent. We, we, we don't like this. We give to these politicians. These politicians agree with us, maybe for money, maybe they agree anyway. It's all kind of public. But here's the problem. If I disagreed with Israel, well, maybe I'd have a problem with it. But why would I be mad if they're on my side? I'm on the same side. I, I think TikTok, TikTok, TikTok is a menace to America. So, yeah, it's probably true that uh, Israel is putting the uh, pressure on. It's probably true that in the context of a hot war, when we see the Palestinian propaganda and we see how the machine works, it not only made a clear and present danger to our ally, Israel, uh, but it, it had the double benefit of showing you how dangerous TikTok could be in the middle of a hot war. So I don't think this is so much a clever conspiracy theory that's been uncovered as exactly what it looks like. Israel would, of course, not want the CCP to be able to manage the algorithm. 
America, separate from Israel, would of course not want that to happen. And I, separate from both of them, <laughs> it just as a citizen, uh, I don't want TikTok to have that power. So um, a lot of the anti, uh, anti-Israel, anti anti-Jewish stuff is because people are seeing patterns and they think the pattern is telling them something and it might be telling them something different. Every time you see Jewish people do something that's smart, and right in front of you, like it's public, such as many Jewish people leading big organizations. (laughs) Maybe it's because smart people do smart things. Like, how does that not explain everything you see? Smart people doing smart things. If you were good at school, you you do good in school, and you get a good job, and then you have power over lots of stuff. That's how you get power. You work hard and go to school and get the right kind of education. So you should see Jewish Americans in all kinds of important roles. And when they act in a way that's pro-Israel, it's always transparent. You, you, can, you can see it exactly who's getting paid, what, why they're doing it, what they've said before. And they are an ally. So there's plenty of things you can complain about, and I have, right? You know, it's not, I'm not agreeing with everything Israel's ever done. That's not my job. Uh, but I do like that it's transparent. So that's something. I would like the job of, uh, I would like a cabinet position myself. I'd like to be the secretary of debunking hoaxes. Now, I wouldn't be the best for that job. I would recommend Steve Cortez. But we should actually have a cabinet position for debunking hoaxes. Why not? It's the most important thing happening. Because Trump is barely terrible at it, if I may say. Trump is terrible at debunking his own hoaxes. He's really bad at it. Other people do it better. And, you know, Joel Pollack is another one. People who have written about, uh, you know, the various hoaxes against Trump. So if they're not available... You know, if uh, Joel and Steve don't want the job, I'd like to be the secretary of debunking hoaxes. Now, I won't take a salary. It won't cost you a penny. I'll do it for free. Uh, The condition is I don't have to commute. No commuting. So no pay, no commuting. I don't want to go to meetings. And uh, Lord knows you don't want to have me on any Zoom calls. Say no more. Say no more. And... um, I think I would be called the Secretary of Debunking Hoaxes, and it would be the most uh, important job in the administration, (laughs) which is weird because it might actually be the most important job in the administration. If if Trump could become president, and then there would be an actual, literally a cabinet position to debunk all the hoaxes, it would really, really help him. So I say it jokingly, but in the real world it would work. It would actually work. Because the, the news wouldn't be able to leave it alone, would they? Imagine if it were announced. New cabinet position, uh, the secretary of debunking hoaxes. His first job will be the fine people hoax. Then he'll be moving on to bloodbath, <laughs> etc. All right. Um, so apparently uh, there's a new survey. And uh, we got big problems with men and women in the United States because uh, 76% of women said they would reject a potential date because the person was MAGA. 60% of women said they would reject anybody who said all lives matter. What's that sound like? 60% would reject you for a date if she said all lives matter. Does that sound like people who prefer self-harm? Because if you don't think your own life matters, literally you don't think your own life matters and that people could say that out loud, that's a preference for self-harm. Once you see the pattern, you see it just so clearly. It's all just self-harm. It's mental health uh, dressed up as something else. It's just bad mental health. 
All right, uh, let's see. Um, so as you know, the black and Hispanic vote seems to be moving a little bit toward Trump, maybe a lot. Uh, so Nate Silver, who's good with the statistics stuff, you probably know, um, he said Biden is now only winning uh, Hispanics by seven percentage points, and that's down from winning them by 24 points in 2020. So four years of calling Trump a racist resulted in far more Hispanic support. Far more. Meanwhile, uh, black voters... Uh, so Biden is winning his black voters by 55%. He has 55 um, points. As compared to, he was up 83 points in 2020. So dropping from an 83% point to 55, that's a total collapse. And during that time, the mainstream media was nonstop saying that Trump was a racist. And during that time, he picked up massive black support. Do you think the public is starting to figure out that the news isn't real? I feel like they're getting the hint. And I'll tell you, nothing has been more powerful when I get into an argument with a crazy Democrat than to say, you still think the news is real? Because that actually is the whole argument for every topic. Okay, hold on. You think the news is real? It's just a total uh, conversation stopper. You should not have an, or, a, any kind of uh, discussion with somebody who thinks the news is real. You can't really have one. You have to, the, the opening bid to have a conversation with me about politics is to understand that the news isn't even intending to be real. Yeah, and I don't know when it was, if it ever was, I don't know if it changed or we just found out about it. Anyway, um, so uh, attorney, former Attorney General Eric Holder was on uh, Bill Maher's show on Friday. And it's funny how, how blatantly they can say what's going on. Listen how blatant this is. So Holder said, uh, quote, there's work to be done, but I'm actually optimistic. He's talking about how Biden was down in the polls. So Biden's down in the polls, but he says, there's work to be done, but I'm actually optimistic that if we stay committed, focused, and as the media turns its attention to making this a binary choice between a person who's got some age and cognitive issues, that would be Trump, <laughs> against somebody who has actually accomplished a lot, I think we'll do just fine. Now, the important part of that sentence you should have caught is that as the media turns its attention, Biden will go up in the polls. He's actually saying out loud that the media will determine the vote. There's no other way to interpret that. He's saying that the media, at the, the way they're covering it right now, has Biden down. And when they cover it differently, and by differently, I mean the way Democrats want them to cover it, and they're very confident that the media will start covering it the way Democrats want them to cover it, that's what he's saying, and that that will change the election result. He's saying directly that the voters are just downstream from the opinion given to them by the news. He's saying it directly. There's no other way to interpret this, that the news will change the vote. And he's not even worried because he knows that by election day, the news will have done its job. All right. Uh, there's a new uh, Kraken update. Kraken, of course, being the uh, alleged future claim that uh, maybe something will be found about the old 2020 election to prove that it was rigged, which has not been done yet. So we don't have proof of that. But very interesting developments. So there's an election integrity attorney who works for Election Integrity Group called Stephanie Lambert, who got picked up and arrested in Washington, D.C. Now, she's one of the people you know, claiming that the election has irregularities, and she got picked up on some unrelated charge. 
which is suspicious in itself because we we ask ourselves, would that have happened if she were not working on this election integrity thing? W- would everybody have been treated that way? In a normal world, I'd say, well, that's probably a coincidence. She did something wrong, and it, that's just when they picked her up. In the context of Peter Navarro being going to prison, I say uh, it's illegitimate and it's lawfare. That's my assumption, because that's where we are. If anybody wants me to assume differently, then maybe you should help me get the political prisoners out of jail. Because to me, it looks like another political prisoner. I don't, I don't think she spent any time in jail, but she got picked up for something. Some, some things she did in the course of her job. Anyway, here's what has allegedly been discovered from, quote, leaked documents from Dominion Voting Systems. Now, in order for me to stay out of jail and not be sued, let me say that I'm only reporting what other people are saying and my own opinion of whether it's valid or true is somewhat irrelevant. <laughs> uh, but I'll just tell you, and you can make up your own mind. So there are leaked documents, allegedly, about uh, regarding Dominion voting systems. Um, and let me read the one sentence that I hope I wrote down. Oh, darn it. Uh, But there are two different systems. uh, Oh, here it is. So this is an actual line from uh, some people who were talking about, I don't know, some testing or something with the Dominion machines. And, quote, this is in writing, and we have this now. We have two different systems flagging logins from Kosovo, Serbia. Just need to ensure that they are really Novena, who is somebody they're working with, If not, we'll disable the account. Wait, what? There's somebody in a foreign country that had access to the machines? A non-American? And there might have been two logins from over there, and they're trying to make sure if it's the one non-American that they know about or some other non-American? Now, I think you need to hear the other side of the story before you you have a final judgment. And I don't think this quite qualifies as a kraken, but do you think it's true that a Serbian was accessing the Dominion machines and they were aware of it and it was just part of their ongoing process? And that somebody from Serbia could call in and change something on the machine? So I don't know how much uh, importance to put on this. I think the only thing that feels true is that there might have been a non-American who was involved with access to the machines, which would be something you'd ask some questions about. So I think it's short of any, I think it's short of proof. Um, And I think Dominion's safe so far that they'll probably just say, ah, it was normal. But that's going on. Kyle Becker's on this. So pe- people have look- the people who have looked at it think they have something. I have not looked at it in enough detail to, to know that that's true. But I warn you, as with all election irregularity stories, that at least 95% of them will turn out you know, to not pan out. And we don't know about this one. All right, Thomas Massey said this to scare us all. He said, uh, I've come to the conclusion that an economic catastrophe must happen before a majority of my colleagues, that's in the Congress, will get serious about curbing out of control government spending. So he says that short of an economic collapse, uh, the government will never take seriously cutting expenses. What do you think of that? I agree. <laughs> yeah, We've developed a system that guarantees economic collapse. Because the responsibility is too distributed. So any one person can say, well, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I, I, I kept saying they should cut those other expenses. But I didn't get a choice, so I had to, I had to vote for the bill that was there because it's not what I wanted. But it's the only bill I had. It was either shut the government or vote for the bill. So we've designed a system which guarantees that the people in charge of 
budget and fiscal uh, responsibility, it guarantees they'll do the opposite. The system guarantees that we'll run up massive debts and not be able to do anything about it. Now, the only counter to Thomas Massey's point, which I totally get, is that it's a straight line projection, meaning it assumes that things just sort of stay the same until we fall off the edge. And now normally I would mock that kind of prediction, except that it's part of a system that guarantees you get there. <laughs> if it were not part of a system that kind of guarantees it's going to happen, it's not just something you're guessing from the, the free market or you know, the, you know, some unpredictable thing in the real world. This is very predictable. It, it's, it's been a straight line march for 40 years, right? More debt, more debt. No. There's no indication whatsoever that there's anybody in Congress who's willing to you know, work on it uh, at their own personal risk in the short run. So here we get to compare what I call the Adams Law of Slow-Moving Disasters to this prediction. Now, this, is, this might be the hardest one. Now, remember, I always say that if everybody can see the same problem coming, and we all know it's coming, and we all agree what it is and exactly what it is. You know, there's no mystery about what it is. Under those conditions, we always find a solution. But this one's weird, because the problem is in the design of a system that is our government, our government itself. So is there anybody powerful enough to change the incentive of every member of the government? or at least a majority. That's a pretty big ask. But here are the things which could happen that are not a straight line um, projection. I think there's a good chance money will become useless. And there goes your debt. <laughs> now, in other words, the people who are owed the money at some point might say, ah, just keep it. I couldn't spend it anyway. It doesn't have any value. Now, that's because it might be something about Bitcoin. It might be something about AI and robots. Uh, um, I, had, I had said that I thought um, whatever money of the future will be digital and it would be backed by robot labor. Robot labor. Because that would be the only thing that had lasting value. And, and maybe land. Land and robot value. But then I saw um, Sam Altman clip in which he was saying that the great economic unit in the future might be computer processing because you need these you know, massive data centers to run the robots. I like, I like his take maybe a little bit better than my own because here's, here's where I was blind. I was kind of imagining that the robot was its own separate entity, but really it might be more proper to think of the robot as part of the data center, like it's all one design. Does that make sense? Because the data center is probably going to give it its AI. It's probably going to be updating it, keeping it running, et cetera. So the, the robot will probably just always be attached to a data center that's processing all the time. So it might be that compute, compute power is the only economic value in the future or the thing that we base a currency on. So I'm going to say that the Adams Law of Slow-Moving Disasters does suggest that we'll get out of it. I think the fact that El Salvador went to Bitcoin and may be able to pay off all of their foreign debts with Bitcoin because Bitcoin just went up in value. I think that might change people's minds about what money is worth. So I do feel bad that I worked all my life to uh, get money when it doesn't have any value. Um, however, I guess I would ask this question. If, if money stopped having value because it was replaced with some digital thing, um, stocks would still be worth something, right? As long as they were making money. Well, as long as they're making some form of money, whether it's the US dollar or something else. So I think owning stocks still makes sense because if all the companies in the United States go broke, well, you're screwed anyway. There's nothing you can do. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to put my bet down on the Adams Law of Slow-Moving Disasters, taking care of our national debt, but not by paying it off. 
I think by making it useless sometime in the future. I think that's what's going to happen. Anyway, so just to scare you in case you were thinking of <laughs> investing. Uh, speaking of stuff like that, Trump apparently won't be able to make his bond. So he had to get over $400 million. Uh, and now a bond, what a bond is, is a short-term way to get some money. It's almost like a loan. Uh, that if he were to default on whatever it, whatever it is he's supposed to do, that he would lose the value of the uh, the bond anyway. But no insurance company, those are the people who issue bond, um, that kind of bond, uh, no insurance company wants to get involved. Why do you think they don't want to get involved? Do you think because they don't think they can make money? Or do you think it's because if they help President Trump, it will be so bad for business and their employees will be so mad that they just can't handle it? It is a loan. It's a loan, it's a loan in a sense. And so the way a bond works, um, it has some loan qualities, but let me explain it this way. So I had to get a bond when I built my house that protected some trees on the property that the... the my town said, uh, you can't hurt those trees, and you have to put up a bond. So that meant I had to pay um, some amount of money to a company that would issue a bond that if I cut down that tree and I didn't pay for it myself, that the bond company would pay it. And you know, so they, they basically take a risk, and they can put money forward. Now, in my case, I think I, I did the bond myself. So I gave I had to give the city $25,000 that they would just hold in an escrow until I was done with construction and I could prove that the tree was still there. Right. So it's not, it's not exactly a loan, but there's some loan-like qualities to it. All right, so yeah, it's more like insurance. It's sort of a combo insurance plus a loan you know, hybrid kind of thing. Anyway, insurance companies won't touch it. I assume it's because the mainstream media has demonized Trump to that point. But here's the thing. Whoever sells him a bond is going to make a lot of money fast. Because in order to get a $400 million bond, he's probably going to have to pay $10 million that just never comes back. Now, I'm making up the $10 million, but it's something like that. Is anybody, in, is anybody in the bond business? What do you think it would cost him out of pocket to get the bond company or insurance company to insure his potential risk? $10 million? You say 5%? <clears throat> so $20 million? You think $20 million? You think $40 million? 10%? Yeah. So somewhere in that range, you know, maybe it's negotiable, 10 to $40 million. And your risk would be that he never uh, that he never paid any money that he was due after appeals and everything, which would be a big risk. But he does have assets to back it. So I wonder if there's some way that his, um, his fans and backers could put together a fund that would do this function and they could make some money. So, so suppose there was, who knows, I, I assume this is all illegal because you'd have to set up as an insurance company and get, there, there's probably a whole bunch of legal hoops you'd have to go through to be in this business, so to speak. But in theory, um, if somebody said, Scott, would you put up $100 in some kind of GoFundMe if you knew that it, um, at the end you could get $110 back? To which I'd say, yeah, sure. Because I think the odds of getting $110 back are pretty good. And if I lost $110, I could still survive. And I think it would be the right thing to do. Yeah, I'd put it in $100. So I don't know if there's any option for you know group uh, funding of that. But um, I don't know if we could get to $400 million. But we might. What What is uh, $81 million? What's 80 million? If 80 million people would have to pay, uh, do the math. How much would each of his 
supporters have to pay to get to 400 million. <laughs> All right. Well, you can do the math yourself. <laughs> All right. Uh, someone asked, can you break out of the simulation? If we're part of a simulation, we're not real, we're zeros and ones, can you break out of it? What do you think? If we're a simulation, do you think there'd be a way to find a find an error in it and break out? Well, I think the way you break out might be dying. I don't recommend it. But, you know, I always have this thought that when you die in this life, you wake up in a chair in the other life. And you've got some sensors on your head. And you're like, ooh, where was I? And then they tell you that you were in a simulation. And it was like a game. And then I say, well, how long was I there? And they say, well, in the time span of the simulation, you were there for 100 years. But in our world, it was only a minute and a half. Because time is different you know, in our world. So you're under, you're gone for a minute and a half. You've lived an entire life. You come back with a bunch of memories and learnings. You're smarter. You've had all this experience, but it took a minute and a half. Now, I'm not going to predict that that's what really happens. It's just a fun thought. However, I would, I would challenge you on the following thought. Have you ever noticed that the people who really believe in the simulation are doing unusually well in life. Now, Elon Musk is the obvious one for that. And I've done okay. And I also literally believe we're in a simulation, not figuratively. And I wonder if you studied all the people who believe we're in a simulation, if you would find that they're doing better. And here's why I think that's important. I think that you can't get out of this simulation, but you can hack it. I think you can hack it with your uh, mindset. And I think that since we know that consciousness can uh, collapse a wave, we know that observing something makes it real for the first time. Is it a big stretch to say that the way you're thinking could change what becomes real? If you accept the magic trick that observation makes something real for the first time, which is what physics tells us, that things aren't real, they're only potential until they're observed or measured. And measured makes it real in the sense that somebody could check the measurement later if they wanted to. So I don't think it's a big leap to say you can author your own life by thinking your way to a better situation. Now, some of it might be just built into the fact that a positive attitude would make you try more things and put more energy into it. And maybe that's all you need to succeed. Maybe the world just rewards people who have that mindset. But I would look for the correlation. Yeah, look for the correlation of people who think we are in a simulation and have unusually good outcomes. Yeah, and I put myself in that category. My life is so strange, the unusual outcomes I've had. So I was asked earlier if I could have more positivity in our negative world. Well, yes, here's some positivity. I do think that we'll invent our way out of most of our problems, from our you know, food sources being poisoned to our sources of, you know, so, so you heard stories about that would improve farming with our fertilizer. Uh, we'll have more energy if the Bill Gates thing works out and it causes more of a floodgate of more nuclear stuff. So we are we do look like we're heading in the right direction on energy. I think we're definitely heading in the right direction on we will head in the right direction on the border because Trump is leading in the polls. So in all likelihood we're at, we have a solution coming for that. And it should have, it should end the question forever. Right? We knew what happened when we let, opened the border. We'll choose not to do that again. So there are a whole bunch of things that are trending right. Um, the one that bothers me the most is the debt, so I agree with Massey on that. But we have had time. We've had enough time to think about it. And I think that we'll probably figure a way out. Don't know how, 
It might be hard, but I think we will. Um, so I'm looking for a big improvement in government by, you know, by the by this time next year, and I think the Ukraine war most questions have now been answered, meaning that it's not going to turn nuclear, because why would it, right? The, any reason that it ever had to become nuclear are now gone, right? Putin has essentially accomplished what he needs to accomplish. We just need to recognize it and figure out how to wind things up. So, uh, all right, I'm seeing people say that uh, the CIA won't let Trump win. Well, you know what? I would have said that except that we're all watching now. I don't know how they could do that and not have every single person know exactly what happened. Uh, I feel as though uh, if they try to take Trump out, it doesn't matter who pulls the trigger. You're just going to think, you're going to think it was the CIA. So I don't think they can get away with it unless they have so much power that they can do it right in front of us and just say, nah, that didn't happen, even if we know it did. Supersonic missiles would be enough, yeah, but he doesn't need to do that because it would destroy Russia too. Uh, you think they'll make it look like an accident? Nobody would believe the accident either. Nobody's going to believe it, a plane wreck, that's for sure. <laughs> Although they are, huh. If ever there was going to be a Trump plane wreck, the best time to do it would be after you've primed the public that the planes are all falling apart. Hmm. We are being primed that the airplanes are not safe. That is a little suspicious. Yeah, I'd be worried about that, actually. But I think we'll be okay. I think that if you get your mindset right, you'll be in good shape. Now, here's something I would love to see. This will never happen. So you got a bunch of podcasters who say lots of stuff. And don't you wonder which of them are making their audiences happier and healthier? Don't you wonder about that? Because... I'm pretty sure that my audience has lost weight and quit drinking. You know, not everybody, but more than the average. I'm pretty sure you were taking vitamin D supplements the first week of the pandemic, because I mentioned it so often. And I, I think you have a whole bunch of mindset advantages, from talent stacks to systems being better than goals, et cetera. So I would love to, if there were some way, and there isn't really, to measure the improvement in the lives of the audiences. I think I might have the biggest, no, maybe not. You know, I think Jordan Peterson and, you know, um, Andrew Huberman probably are getting really good results for their audiences. But I, I think I'm in the top 10 for somebody who has an audience that's getting healthier and getting more wealthier. So I'm happy about that. All right, I wish it could be measured. All right, that's all I've got for you today. I'm going to say goodbye to the YouTube and uh, and Rumble and X people, and then I'm going to fire up a separate after show for the locals people who are subscribing, and we'll chat with them a little bit. And thanks for joining. All right, we'll see you tomorrow, same, same time, same place. <laughs>